Welcome to Influence, the show about one of the university's founding colleges, the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences. I'm your host, Emily Shaw. On today's episode, we'll be learning about the Mississippi Entomological Museum, and our first guest is Dr. Joe Von Heel, an assistant research professor in the Department of Biochemistry, Molecular Biology, Entomology, and Plant Pathology. Welcome, Dr. Hill. Yeah, thank you for having me. Could you tell us about the museum? Yes, the, the museum, Mississippi Entomological Museum, is mm -hmm. located on campus here in Starkville. Um, it was founded in 1980 by mm -hmm. William Cross, a uh, USDA entomologist who, uh, he was a boll weevil entomologist, okay. but he saw, he, he enjoyed collecting insects and he realized that we needed a research collection here on campus and we, we didn't have one. So he got together uh, the state plant board collection, uh, the university had a, had a small collection, teaching collection. Mm -hmm and then the USDA had a collection. So he got uh, the administration together and they formed uh, the, the collection in 1980 and joined all three of those collections together. And they hired a uh, museum director mm -hmm. who is Dr. Richard Brown, he's still here. Um, and uh, so we are tasked with documenting the insect fauna of Mississippi. Currently the museum houses uh, one and a half million wow. specimens. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quite large. We're the, uh, one of the three largest collections in the in the southeast. Um, and we have strengths, uh, uh, Lepidoptera, the butterflies and moths. Those okay. are Dr. Brown's specialties. Okay. So of course he's he's the boss. So yeah. uh, we have strong holdings in those. Sure. But we also have really strong holdings in uh, ants. We've had long time funding to do ant research. Mm -hmm. So we have one of the best ant collections in the region. Uh, and I work on grasshoppers, so okay. uh, we have a, a really strong grasshopper collection also, but also wood-boring beetles. We do mm -hmm. doing surveys for uh, exotic wood-boring pests that could damage and, you know, timber here in the state, which is one of our big commodities. Okay. Um, recently, this, this last year, we came, we acquired three additional collections. Two of them were university collections, okay. and one was a private collection. The, probably the most notable was the University of Louisiana at Monroe collection, which made, uh, a lot of headlines uh, earlier in the year uh, with the university getting rid of its collection. But uh, we, we were very fortunate to be able to acquire that collection. Um, I mostly went after it because it had a lot of grasshoppers in it. Mm -hmm. I had gone to that collection before mm -hmm. and worked at it because it was a, a, a good grasshopper collection. But when we got it back, we found that it, there were actually some other little gems in that collection. Like there were 12 specimens of the Xerxes blue butterfly. Oh, wow. which went extinct in the 1930s and was actually the first species to be, you know, to be documented that humans caused the extinction of. Okay. It's a little butterfly that lived around uh, San Francisco and its habitat was wiped out by housing development. Wow. Um, so there are, there are no more of those in existence and uh, these specimens probably weren't even known to science before. So we got those um, and then I was going through the grasshoppers and found a specimen of the Rocky Mountain locust, which was one of the first big agricultural pests of the U.S. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was sort of the impetus for the USDA being okay. formed. This wow. grasshopper used to darken the skies in the Midwest. Um, it was a, a plague to settlers. Mm -hmm. And uh, and then in the late 1800s, it, it went extinct. And no one knows why. Um, it was sort of a mystery, but mm -hmm. it, was, it was studied intensively, but the thing just disappeared. And of course, there are no more specimens of it. And uh, there was one or there are no more live individuals, right. but we have, we now have a specimen of it. It's very so, exciting. So yeah. What do we use the specimens for? How do they help us? Yeah, so, so we use the specimens for, for actually, there are lots of uses for them. Uh, first and foremost, they document the occurrence okay. of a species somewhere. So on, you know, uh, along with the specimen, often if you've seen a bug collection mm -hmm. for a made sure. one, you put the insects on right. a pin. So we're more than just that. So with the specimens, we have a label that goes on there that says when, where, okay. uh, who, how that insect was collected, what habitat it was in, all that. So there's all that information that comes along mm -hmm. with the, those specimens. And so once you get a series of specimens from, you know, across its distribution, whatever, you can start figuring out questions like what time of year is it out? Okay. What does it eat? Um, all those sort of life history type things. What kind of habitats does it occur in? But also you can go back and, you know, like these extinct things, we can pull DNA out of those. Um, you know, you can go back and uh, for bees, you can pull the pollen off okay. the bees and see what they were pollinating. That's very um, interesting. You know, you can go back and test for pesticide residue 
on things. Um, all, there's all sorts of things you can do. Okay. So yeah. when you go out to collect, where do you go? <laughs> um, so I'm a grasshopper guy. Uh -huh. um, and of course, uh, we do have a few grasshopper species here in the state that occur in forested situations, okay. but most of them occur in grasslands. And so, uh, and a lot of people don't, don't think about having grasslands in the southeast, okay. but we do actually have a lot of grasslands. We have blackland prairies, longleaf pine savannas, and lots of kind of rock outcrops and things that are, that are naturally open. And that's where we find a lot of our, obviously a lot of our grasshopper right. species. There's about 160 grasshopper species in the southeast, and uh, a majority of those occur in these grasslands, which is, you know, makes sense. But a lot of them are only found in those, those specific types of grasslands, like uh, the longleaf pine savanna. There are 70 species that are only found in that habitat and nowhere else. Like you don't find them in, say, a pasture or, you know, a roadside or something like that. They're only in these sort of pristine habitats. Um, so go there and we still find lots of new species. I've described 24 new species of grasshoppers wow. from the southeast in the last five years. That is very interesting. So there's still lots of, lots of new stuff to find out there. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. And when we come back, we'll hear from a research technician in the museum. Okay. It's a simple idea. Knowledge that transforms lives shouldn't be limited to those on a campus, but extended to any and all who want or need it, wherever they are. At Mississippi State University, we've been making that possible for more than 100 years through the MSU Extension Service. What began as an effort to extend the latest research to farmers has become something much more. Today, we're helping Mississippians from all walks of life, giving them the tools they need to build a brighter future. We're sparking the imagination of students around the state and inspiring the next generation of doctors. We're helping rural communities find their way to the internet and connect to the world at large. And we're teaching families how to lead healthier lives in ways both big and small. MSU is standing firm in its commitment to that one simple idea. Extend the knowledge that transforms lives wherever they are. Have you ever thought about what it would take to eliminate one of the most dreaded illnesses of the year? At Mississippi State University, we're dreaming big, fast on the heels of scientific discoveries that will lead to the prevention, diagnosis, and treatment of flu and other illnesses. For researchers, the biggest challenge is keeping pace with viruses that are constantly evolving to become more contagious. But at Mississippi State, we have the upper hand. Our scientists are working with teams around the world to predict when and where new viruses will emerge, combining forces to create flu vaccines before epidemics actually hit. That's because as a premier research university, we believe it is our responsibility to help improve the lives of those around us. And we're working hard to help create a world where the flu is something children will one day read about in history books. Welcome back to Influence. Our next guest is Jason Sanders, a research technician at the Mississippi Entomological Museum. Welcome, Jason. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. I'd like to hear about the outreach program of the museum. Yeah, so we um, have a great outreach program. It's called the Mississippi Bug Blues. I think uh, it used to be called Don't Get the Mississippi Bug okay. Blues. <laughs> but um, so one of my tasks when I first mm -hmm. came in, I'm a, a graphic designer by trade. Okay. And so I was tasked with changing the logo and okay. updating the website. Mm -hmm. And so I kind of changed the name too, but yeah. um, uh, they let me do kind of what I wanted to with it. And I think it's turned out really good. And um, I kind of made everything blue okay. as well. Yeah, but makes sense. Yeah, so uh, really though, the outreach program, it's been around since 2012. Okay. I've only been working on it for a little over a year. Mm -hmm. But what we normally do is just go around the state and we do tabling events and partner events. So we uh, do the Mississippi State Fair. Mm -hmm. We do the, um, the garden show mm -hmm. in 
Crystal Springs. Yep. And so we do a lot of events and we're also working with the museums in Jackson. And so they've invited us to do some of their museum, museum events such as the Science Museum, Natural Science Museum does a lot of things down there and the Ag Museum does a science day where okay, you, yeah. everybody gets to go. So um, we reach about 15,000 people a wow. year. And our main goal is to teach people about invasive insect species coming into Mississippi. Okay. And a lot of people don't really have um, uh, any idea mm -hmm. that we are affected by some of these things. And, and so, um, and then another big partner that we have is the YES program, it stands for Youth Environmental Science. Mm -hmm. And it's a program, um, and I might get all the grades wrong, but I think they take K through eight okay. in the school systems and they immerse them in environmental science for a week each grade or each class mm -hmm. for a week. Oh, and so great. we get to teach for about an hour to an hour and a half every third, fourth, and fifth grader in the district um, some of the stuff from our uh, outreach program. So what are the types of things you would teach inside the school? Okay, so um, mostly we focus on the emerald ash borer. It is okay. a wood boring beetle that came into Michigan uh, the early 2000s from China. And uh, so it's, um, it's a threat to Mississippi. Mm -hmm. It's in every state around us right now, okay. but it's not here yet. And so we just want people to be aware. And we think one of the ways that it travels is through firewood. And so we teach the kids about okay. firewood safety, moving firewood, how that can affect the environment mm -hmm. by moving an insect, and then other things like that. And so we have a lot of um, invasive insects, some, some that are actually here and some that are a threat. And so we, uh, we're trying to tailor the curriculum uh, to each grade uh, yeah. And so third graders are a little more excited about things sure. and then fifth graders are a little more less excited. And so we try to get True. them excited <laughs> the best we can uh, just with different ways. And so we're actually trying to figure out better and new ways to uh, challenge the kids to uh, it, just view the world around them with a little more curiosity, care and consideration. Absolutely. Do you get the chance to take any specimens into the schools? Yes, sometimes we take live roaches. And so um, I think there might be a picture somewhere around. Um, but, uh, and I had longer hair then. <laughs> but yeah, so we, uh, the kids get really excited. Uh, some kids are really scared. And so, yeah. um, but uh, we also have some great display drawers from specimens in the museum. Mm -hmm. And I, uh, I'll take those as well. I, I tend to take as many visual aids as I possibly can just to try to make it more real for them. So are these students viewing a live specimen? Oh, yes, that is a live uh, Madagascar hissing cockroach. Wow. So it's, it's an example of an exotic insect that um, isn't, doesn't really cause problems here, but um, it's just, it's good to teach about the anatomy of insects and to just show them uh, insects that they might not normally see around Mississippi. Speaking of exotics, what kind of work do you do with those? Exotic, so I, I'm just mainly for the outreach program. So okay. the only work that I do with exotics is just to teach the general public about okay. them. So I don't, uh, since I am a graphic designer, everything that I've done, I've just had to learn uh, mm -hmm. through teaching and through uh, just uh, learning about it uh, through research and things like that. And so that's usually my role is just to kind of head up the outreach things. Okay, anything new and exciting coming in 2018? Uh, yeah, we're kind of working on an event right now, the, uh, the Mississippi State Insect Fair. Okay. But um, that we, we're still in the works, so we'll see Sounds what exciting. we can pull out. Absolutely. Well, thanks for joining us today, Jason. Thank you so much. And thank you for joining us on Influence, on where this episode we learned about the Mississippi Entological Museum. And we'll see you next time on Influence.